Hello and welcome to our next problem here where we're looking at testing for equality across multiple population proportions. So what we're going to be looking at here is, just get myself organized, so here we're going to have a, a test. Again, in earlier modules we had looked at testing for equality across only two population proportions. So they looked something like this, it's either equal or it's not equal. Well, now what we're going to be doing is looking at multiple population proportions. So this can be three, or it can really be as many as we want. And if that's the case, well, now the alternative hypotheses, it, it's going to look a little bit different. A really common mistake that I often see are students going like this, that they're all simultaneously not equal. That's a possible outcome for sure, but it's not necessarily what we're testing for. All we're testing for here is that th in the null, they're either all equal, or in the alternative, they're not all equal. Not all are equal. So all this implies is that if we reject the null hypotheses, it means at least one of them is different. Uh, and if that's the case, then we have a procedure, uh, as we'll see in part E, uh, Marasquilio procedure to identify where a difference exists, if any, of course, uh, if appropriate, right? So if we reject, then we'll want to take it to the next step and see where the difference lies. So let's get into this exercise. Here uh, we're looking at uh, oh, the recent election. So here we decided to determine if there was a difference in the proportion of voters who changed their mind uh, at the last minute. So I thought I wrote the whole campaign, I thought I was going to vote for this party, and then at the last minute I changed my mind. Some voters choose early on in the campaign who they'll vote for and stick with it. Others may change their mind when new information becomes available. This might shed light on why some voters are more susceptible to information released close to election day. So in order to gather data, we produce a survey that asks respondents which party they voted for and if it was a result of a change of intentions within uh, the four weeks prior to election day. So here's our data. We have Republican, Democrats, and others, or for the Canadian viewers, uh, here we have our Liberals, we have our Conservatives, and we have others, we have a few others that we can lump into that group. So um, let's get into our numbers. So for, for part A, formulate the null and alternative hypotheses. Well, here we, we're keeping it simple. We're keeping it simple, only keeping three uh, populations. We can do more, but it just adds unnecessary work without really showing us anything new. So we'll just keep it to, to three, three proportions. So they're either all equal or they're not. So this is done. Uh, part B, computer expected frequencies. So what that means, so let's specify some level of significance here, alpha 05. So our test statistic that we need for this, <coughs> this is a chi-squared test. Not like when we were looking at two population proportions, it was a simple uh, z-test. Now this is a chi-squared test, and what we need to do are add up all of these differences between the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies uh, squared divided by expected frequencies. So this can be a bit of a tedious calculation, especially these expected frequencies that we have to calculate. So that's going to be uh, our first job as for part B. So what does that mean, our expected frequency? Well, as all hypothesis tests that we've done, we always do these under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, uh, unless we have evidence to show otherwise. So if all three of these proportions are equal, uh, what would be our expected frequencies uh, in this data set. So what we need to do here is identify, here's our table, so in our sample we had 112 out of 220 said uh, yes, their voting intentions changed uh, for the Republican voters, so on and so forth for each of our three parties. If the null hypothesis is true, and if these are all the same, all these proportions are equal in the population, well then that means that we can ignore these values and then say, well, our point estimate of that common proportion, well that would just be 277 out of 503. So this gives us a, a common 
population proportion of 277 divided by 503. So that means uh, 0.55. So here again, we're just looking at those who responded yes, and we're saying 55% or a proportion of 0.55, they all said yes, they changed their voting intentions within the last four weeks. And so that's regardless of which party they ended up voting for. Now, now we can look at, okay, so of the Republicans, we talked to 210 of them, uh, who, who were part of that, I voted for Republican. So our expected frequency is that while we spoke to 210 people who voted Republican, we would expect 55% of them would have changed their minds. Assuming that they're all the same, that would be our expected frequency. So then we can take 0.55 times that by 210 and that's going to give us our expected frequency for the Republicans who said yes, so times 210. So that's 115.65. Oops. 115.65. So in this calculation, here I've done it in two steps, but we can see that this is 277 over 503 times 210. So the way that textbooks usually write this out is that you would have 277, that's our rho i total. So here I'm calling this our yes or no, those are our i's, and this is our j's in that formula. Our j's are different political parties. So it's the rho total times the column total, column j total, I'm going to run out of room divided by the total number of observations. So there we have our 277, which was the row total, times 210, that was the column total, divided by 503, that's our total number of observations. So that's why this formula works. Often I think students look at that formula and it doesn't quite make sense. So, so now we can go through and calculate all the rest. So if we look at this one here, this is going to be then 161, 161 times 277 divided by 503. So that's going to be oh, something, oh yeah, 88 points. That's round at 88.7. Grab another pen, 88.7. Okay, now I'm going to skip ahead. I don't want to go through all of these calculations and it'll just take too long. I've got them on the screen here in front of me. So the next one, 72.7. The next is 94.4, 72.3, and 59.3. Okay, now that's all we need, but a nice check to make sure that you haven't made any silly mistakes is that these should all add to the same things. So I might have some rounding errors in here, that's fine if there's some rounding error, not the end of the world, um, but those should definitely all add up to the same amount. So there's part B, that's our table of expected frequencies. So if the null hypothesis is true, these are those frequencies that we would expect to see uh, from that survey. The next step, now we have to calculate the rest of that, excuse me, the rest of that test statistic. So what I'm going to do here, we need to calculate the, the differences between our observed value, the expected value, square it, divide it by the expected value. So let's go like this. Here I'll calculate. We can do these in different steps. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip steps because it's not a really complex calculation. So here I'm just going to produce a column. These are our differences between those values. So that would be under, oops, that would be the difference between a, an observed value and an expected value for all of those. And then we're going to square it and then we're going to divide it by the expected value. And then we'll just add all of those up. And 
that will give us our test statistic. So for the first one, this will be 112. I'll do this manually, but again, I'm going to skip through this. So the first one, our observed value is that 112 minus the expected value, 115.65. So that's the difference. Then we square it, and then we divide it by the expected value, which is 115.65. So that gives us 0.115. So here we have our first value. 0.115. Now if I do it again, here I'll do the no. So let's do this one here. So it'll be this is our observed and our expected. I'll get my calculator out. So then 98 minus 94.4. So there's the difference. We square that. We divide it by the expected value, 94.4 and I have 0.137, so let's call it 0.14. Uh, i get my pen back in, 0.14. Okay, so I've already got all of these calculated. The next one would be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 1.46, 1.48, 0 0.79. So we should have six. So that's comparing all of the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies squared and divided by the expected. So those are all of those individual components, and now we have to add all of those up. So now we apply this summation, and so here we'll add those all together. So 0 0.115 plus 0 0.14 plus 0.5 plus 0 0.61 plus 146 plus 179. And so here I have a chi-squared of point, well, let's just call it 4.0, I guess. It rounds up nicely. Uh, so I'm going to have our chi-squared, get my pen back, our final chi-squared value, just 4.0. I'll keep it just a one decimal. Okay, so that's it. We've got our test statistic. Now the rest is just like any other hypothesis test that we've done. We go to our tables, we get a critical value, uh, p-value, all that fun stuff. So what would our critical value be? Well, we need degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom here is k minus 1, and in this case, k is equal to 1, 2, and 3. So our critical value, chi-squared, 0.05 is our alpha, and we have 3 minus 1, so we have 2 degrees of freedom. If we go to our chi-square tables, so now I'm looking for 2 degrees of freedom, and alpha is 0.05, so there's our critical value there, 5.991. 5.991. Now, I should say, Again, it's one of these situations where you come back, we look at this hypothesis test, and you say, Peter, that's a two-tailed test, right? It's a test for equalities. That must be a two-tailed test. That's such a common mistake. Yes, it's a, it's a test for equalities, but the methodology that we employ is an upper-tail chi-squared test. So this is why when I obtained that critical value, I did not divide alpha by 2, as you might do for a two-tail test. You would divide alpha by 2. But it's an upper-tail chi-squared test, so it's just alpha. We don't divide it by 2. So we have our critical value is 5.99. Our rejection rule, just like any other upper-tail test, is that we will reject if our test statistic, so if our chi-squared, what's going on? If our test statistic is greater than or equal to that critical value, then we will reject. In our case, our test statistic is 4, our critical value is 5.991, our test statistic is less than the critical value, so therefore we do not reject. We can find the p-value, or at least an approximate p-value. Again, if we look, our test statistic was 4. So that's, well, it's somewhere in here. It's a pretty broad range. So our test statistic, our p-value is something greater than 0.1. That's about the best that we can say here. 
So our p-value for this test is something greater than 0.1, and that's enough information to, to know is greater than our level of significance, which we stated back here, our level of significance is 0.05. So we definitely have enough evidence uh, to, to, sorry, we, we don't have enough evidence to reject. Our evidence supports the, uh, the null hypothesis, so we are unable to show that there is a difference in the proportion of voters who changed their voting intention within four weeks of the election. Okay, so that's it for this exercise. We have responded to C. I just gave you my interpretation uh, for Part D. Part E, well, if appropriate, use the Marasquilio procedure to determine where a difference exists. Well, here we just said we don't have evidence to reject. So our evidence in this case supports that alternative, uh, <laughs> supports the null hypothesis that all of our population proportions are equal. Uh, so if I've already shown that they're not different, why would I go and look to see where is the difference? So uh, this problem, there's no reason to do any further analysis. We've shown that there is not a difference in the population proportions. Okay, good. I hope that was helpful. That's all there is to it. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.